there will be a Monday Thursday service in, and that will be in Blackmount Church, Blackmount at 7 p.m. And then on Good Friday, there will be a reflection here in Bigger Kirk at 7 p.m. And then next Sunday, uh, we have two sunrise services, uh, one for the energetic, and uh, that will be featuring the youth group in particular, uh, and they will be meeting at 7 a.m. at St Mary's Hall and then walking up to the knock. So please do join them if you're able. And if you're not feeling quite so energetic or if you've got dodgy knees, uh, there will also be a, a morning service in the graveyard, and that will be at 7.30 a.m. just uh, behind the church here. But importantly, both of these will be followed by breakfast rolls in St Mary's Hall just after 8 a.m. So please, as many people, if you can join us as possible. And then our Easter morning worship at 11.15 uh, will be in the Kirk as normal. And we look forward to welcoming several new members at that service. So please do join us for Easter Sunday morning. Uh, just a final thing about the food bank. Um, there's been an amazing response to the food bank in the town in general, in Bigger. Um, but to give you some idea of the kind of pressures on the food bank, I believe they get through a thousand cans of beans every month. Um, so that's a lot of beans, and uh, they have about £2,000 that they're having to spend on food top-ups as well. Um, so please do continue to support the food bank and, and really uh, give them your support, particularly at this time. Um, and now I am required to introduce Anne, who has something to tell us. Thanks, Cameron. Um, Mike has been encouraging us to, to think about maybe taking a few notes um, uh, uh, during the service just to remind us of some of the things that we're learning, some of the things that God is saying to us during a service. But um, as a teacher, I thought, well, not everybody likes to write the notes. And um, I know myself, if I'm ever you know, taking notes, sometimes I like to kind of doodle them. And, and that helps me to remember better. And I've, I've kind of shown you what I mean by that. this. I've kind of doodled uh, last week's service. You, can, you can't see, but I've got like the, the, the two hands. You remember Mike was showing us how to remember the Ten Commandments and, and, um, and different things that I've doodled there. There's different people might like to do this, uh, but I was particularly thinking, to be honest, of the young people might like to do this if they were maybe not wanting to be a bit older for pew bags. And so I've got 10 clipboards, so if you have not got one just now and you feel you might like to do this during the service, um, if, you, if you go back, Caroline will show you where, where they are. Um, so there are clipboards, there are black pens and paper, and if you wanted to do that during the service today, they are there available and they'll be there every week. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. That's a wonderful idea. Today is Palm Sunday, the day that we celebrate Jesus coming into Jerusalem for the last time, the beginning of Holy Week. And someone kindly made these Ukrainian crosses with the colors of the Ukrainian flag. Was it you? No. Who made them? Anyone want to confess? <laughs> well, it was a wonderful idea. Thank you for doing that. If you didn't get one, there's some as you go out the door. Take it away to remember that today was the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time. And we're going to be thinking about that today. And we're going to sing songs that are all about that theme. And our first one is All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Let's stand and sing together. All Glory, Laud, and Honor.
So normally this Sunday we'd be down in the hall for our cafe service, but we're going to have an all age service all the same. And next Sunday will be all age. We're, Jane and I are going to do a sort of tag team today. But as we come to worship God, let's join in prayer. Let's talk to our Father God who is here in our midst. We come together to worship God this morning and we recognize that our time is not so different from the time in which Jesus first came. In our time, there are wars and other tragedies all over. There are wars, that war in Ukraine, in Yemen, in South Sudan, in Burma. In our time, like in the time of Jesus, people are sick and needing healing. And people are poor and needing a hand up. People are lost and needing direction. We recognize that our world is not so different. But we also recognize that Jesus, the Savior, is no different to what he was way back then. He comes with God's compassion for the sick and the hurting today. He comes to forgive when we have sinned. He comes to guide and strengthen us to follow him as his people. And so, Lord Jesus, we ask you to come among us this morning. Come as you are and as you will. Not how we in our narrow understanding think you should be and think that you should come. Way back then, you humbly came. And you humbly come today. You are the Lord of glory our Savior and our Lord. And so we welcome you into this place and we welcome you into our hearts as we pray together the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Ali's going to bring us our scripture reading this morning, the story that we want to be concentrating on, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem in this last week of his life. Uh, so the reading is taken from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So, I would like to tell you a story. 
and we're going to have some pictures to illustrate the story. Um, but before I do, can I just check, because Mike and I were just making faces at each other. Can everybody hear Mike? No. So um, I'm glad it wasn't just me. Your volume needs to go up or something for Mike. I can't hear what... Yeah. It's, it was working, because it's coming through the loop, but it's coming through the loop very quietly, so hopefully that will improve. Right. We're going to hear a story about a donkey called Dave. Dave the donkey was so excited. He'd been watching all week for Grandpa Donkey to get back from Jerusalem. Dave had some big news he'd been waiting to share with him. Oh, sorry, we seem to be behind. That's it. Okay, I'm going to start again. Dave the donkey was so excited. He'd been watching all week for Grandpa Donkey to get back from Jerusalem. Dave had some big news he'd been waiting to share with him. Grandpa, Grandpa, guess what? I carried the king into Jerusalem. You're joking, Dave. No, Grandpa, I carried the king. I was standing out the front, minding my own business, when the king's servant untied me and led me to the king. The king jumped on my back, and we charged down the hill and up the mountains to Jerusalem. The crowd waved palm branches. The crowd waved palm branches. <laughs> and everyone cheered, hooray for the king, long live the king. We said goodbye, and I headed home, leaving the king to get on with the job of being king. So, Grandpa, you've been in Jerusalem since then. Tell me what happened next. Did the crowd keep cheering for the king? Well, Dave, the crowd were yelling for the king. Wow, said Dave, and I'm sure all the leaders came to meet him. Yes, sighed Grandpa, the king did meet all the leaders. And Grandpa, they would have placed a golden crown upon the king's head. They certainly crowned the king, but it wasn't made of gold. The throne, Grandpa, they must have led the king into the palace, sat him on the throne and cheered, long live the king. No, Dave, sighed Grandpa. There was no throne. They led the king out of Jerusalem and they nailed him to a cross. Dave was stunned. A cross? So, so... The king, the king is dead? No, Dave, the king was dead. The king was placed in a tomb and the tomb was sealed with a heavy stone. But now the king is alive. He was dead, but the tomb is empty and the king is alive. Dave stared across the valley to Jerusalem as the strange and wonderful news rolled through his mind. The king was dead, but now he's alive? Grandpa asked Dave, did you ever carry someone special that you will never forget? Yes, Dave, said Grandpa. As a matter of fact, I did. It was a long time ago, on a starry night like this. I carried someone special that I will never forget. Whoops. <laughs> now, to warm up, I've got a number of pictures or images, signs really, um, that you will see when you're traveling along the roads. And I wonder how many of you will know what they mean. What does this one mean? Shout it out. No entry. No entry. Good. These are the easy ones. And that... What does that mean? 40 mile per hour limit. If you lived in Europe, it would be 40 kilometers per hour, I think. Um, the next one, what is that? Roundabout ahead. No U-turn. And this one, these ones are a bit more difficult. I've lost my... 
Anybody? No vehicles with explosives allowed. <laughs> vehicles with explosives prohibited. What is this one? Frog crossing. That's a good one. Ever seen that? And this. Watch out for big bumps. That's close. Yes, that's probably what you would do if you saw a sign like this. It's risk of grounding. That's what that's happening to that lorry. It's, it's grounded on a bump as it went over the bump. The bump hit the bottom of the car. Very good. Now, my tablet has just died, so I need to... Oh, here we go. Uh, technology. Have I missed a page? Okay. How do you know what these pictures mean? Well, if you took your exam for driving, you will have studied a certain book, and it's called the Highway Code, and the Highway Code tells us what all the signs mean, and I have forgotten half of them. So if you've forgotten them, um, you're in good company or maybe in bad company. I don't know. Today on Palm Sunday, we remember the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, as we were learning from what we read in the Bible, but also from Dave's story. Jesus riding on a donkey by giving us by riding on a donkey, Jesus gives us this sign, a visual picture. Well, you won't find this sign in the highway code. This is a sign that comes from the Bible. The picture that Jesus gave the people then would have meant much to them because they knew what the prophets of the Old Testament had said and had written down long beforehand. This morning, we're going to explore what this picture of a man riding on a donkey meant to the people in Jesus' day and what it might mean to us as well. Jane's going to come and lead us in our first talk. Oh, yes, I've got to give her her script back. <laughs> we really are tactics. In the Old Testament, amongst the prophets, to use pictures just like the pictures we've been looking at. And these pictures were there to communicate God's message and important things to people. And when words didn't work, they would put their messages into a picture or even an action. They would do something that would symbolize what they were trying to communicate. So when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, he used the same principle. He was using an action to communicate to people what God was going to say. And what God wanted to say was two different things. Firstly, Jesus was telling people that he was king. Long before Jesus came to Jerusalem, long before Jesus was even born, a prophet named Zechariah wrote this. See, your king comes to you. Righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So on Dave. Jesus' followers had sent, spent three years hearing him teach, seeing him perform miracles, and telling them to keep quiet about the fact that he was the king, the Messiah, the chosen one, the God that God had promised to send to free his people. And here at last, for all to see, Jesus is going public. No wonder they celebrated. For the crowds who were not yet his followers, but who were living under the Roman occupation and longing for freedom, here was Jesus acting out the prophecy that said, I am the king who will bring victory. It's no wonder they were excited and were shouting and cheering and waving their palms and putting their coats on the road for the donkey to ride on. But the second thing 
Jesus's picture tells us, is what sort of king he came to be. And this really surprised people. Jesus came on a colt, the animal of a man of peace, not on some big war horse, some stallion that would ride at the front of an army, the animal of a conquering king. Zechariah's prophecy spoke of Jesus coming lowly and humbly. But unfortunately, the crowd was so intent on welcoming the Messiah, they paid little attention to that part of Jesus' message. They wanted Jesus to be the one who overthrew the Romans. But Jesus' message, by riding on a colt, was clear to those who wanted to see it. I come in peace, he was saying. So Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey wasn't simply a convenient first century taxi. Jesus was saying through his actions that he was coming as king, but also coming in peace. So we're going to sing another Palm Sunday song now, um, one that surprisingly, for some reason, Mike and I can only remember in Thai when we hear the music, but we're not going to sing it to you in Thai. But it's Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Let's stand, and if you want to wave your palms, feel free to. And the kids come and join me up here at the front. We're going to do a little drama. And I need a, a, a couple of... I need a couple of volunteers as well. I need two kings. Anybody want to be a king today? You want to be a king? Yeah. You could be a one king. Do we have another king? Do you want to be a king? No. Anybody? Come on, please. Do you want to be the other king? A brother-sister sister rivalry in the kingship here. Stand here, if you would. Very good. These are our two kings. We, we said earlier that Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey showed by his actions that he was the coming king, coming in peace, as James said. But what sort of king is Jesus? Let's look at some of the words that we think of when we think of king. Um, I just changed my mind. You've changed your mind? Yeah. Okay. To be the king. You don't want to be the king? No. Well, you could be a different kind of king. But I just want to just don't be a king. Okay. Well, you want to go sit down and someone else can be king. No. Okay. Thank you for being willing. Ruthie, do you want to come and be king? Okay. 
Okay, when we think of king, we think of different words. And uh, I've got three pairs of words that we think of usually when we think of kings. Okay, the first pair of words is a palace and riches. Okay, most kings have riches. They have lots of money. And they wear expensive clothes. They live in beautiful palaces, the best that money can buy. So let's get our money. Okay, you're going to be you're going to be our king here, Samuel. You want to put on the the kingly robe. It's got gold, and it's red as well. You want to help him tie that up. And then there's loads of Monopoly money. This is from the Edinburgh edition of Monopoly. So it's from the Bank of Scotland. That'll be worth a lot. Okay. There's our king with his robe and his loads of dosh. All right. That's what we usually think of when we think of a king. Was Jesus that type of king. Was he that kind of king? Was Jesus that kind of king? Did he have robes and did he live in a palace? No. When Jesus was born, he wasn't laid in a beautiful crib in an expensive palace. As Luke says in his version of the Christmas story, Jesus was wrapped in strips of cloth and he was placed in a manger. What's a manger? It's a place where the animals eat, isn't it? He was placed in a manger because there was no guest room for him available for him and his mom and dad. And as an adult, Jesus said to his disciples, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man, me, has no place to lay his head. Jesus, who was God, The second person of the Trinity gave up the riches of heaven to come to earth. Jesus wouldn't have worn a a fancy gown like that, a robe, but he wore ordinary clothes. So let's give Jesus, this is Jesus, simple, ordinary (laughs) nightshirt. Great. All right. The second pair of words that we think of when we think of a king are power and servants. Most kings have power over other people. They they tell people what to do, and those people do it. They have servants. So let's have a couple of servants. Do you want to be servants? I'll be a servant, too. Come and bow down to the king here. Okay. <laughs> We're bowing down to our king. Tell us what to do and we'll do it. Okay, we're your servants. Got any ideas of what you want us to do? An indecisive king we have. Some Go get him some chocolate. Do you have any chocolate in your bag? No. Sorry, king. We're just play acting. So you can go sit down. <laughs> Was Jesus that kind of king to have servants, to have power over other people? Was he that kind of king? He did have power, but it was a different type of power, and he didn't demand that people served him, did he? Jesus wasn't that kind of king. When a couple of Jesus' disciples started arguing about who was the most important This is what Jesus said to them. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came not to be served, but to serve other people. Jesus came to serve, and one of the things that he did for his disciples in this last week of his life was to wash their dirty and smelly feet before they ate the Passover meal together. So there you go, Jesus. Let's, let's put this 
towel around your neck like you're going off to the shower, <laughs> but you're actually going to wash people's feet, okay? Okay, next set of words that we think of when we think of a king are crown and throne. Most kings have a crown to wear and they sit on a throne from which they rule their kingdom. So let's get, whoop, you want to get a, 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 crown, a, a throne as well? Could you get a chair? There you go. You get to sit on the throne and rule your kingdom from there. Now, was Jesus that kind of king? Did he have a crown? Did he have a throne? Oh, yes. The wonderful scepter that Dave made for me many years ago. You remember that? <laughs> there you go. There's the king on his throne with his money and his robes, and he is powerful. Was Jesus like that? No, he wasn't. Jesus wasn't like that. The only crown that Jesus wore was a crown of thorns, which was placed, and you can, you can hold it, though. No, she can't. It's really you can't. Pretty. I'll it's hold really it. Pretty. I'll hold it. It's a wonderful crown of thorns that I found up in the tower <laughs> here in church. I think we've used that in years past. It was the only crown that was placed on Jesus' head. And they put it there in jest. They said, you're the king of the Jews, aren't you? We're going to make you a crown. And they made him a crown of thorns to pierce his head when it was put on. And Jesus didn't rule from a throne, but he was enthroned on a cross. So there's Jesus' cross. So King Jesus was very different from other earthly kings. We've got our two different kings here. Jesus didn't have palace, uh, a palace, and he didn't have riches. He didn't wear a crown or rule his kingdom from a throne. Jesus wore a crown of thorns, and he gave up his life on a cross. Jesus didn't expect people to serve him, but he served them. You see, Jesus didn't come as a warrior king to set people free from the oppressive Romans, not in the first instance anyway. Jesus came as the king of peace to set people free from the chains of sin and to bring peace between them and God the Father, which he did when he was willing to lay down his life on the cross. And then he rose from the dead three days later to give new life that would last forever for everyone who would put their trust in him. Jesus didn't come as an aggressive and dominating king to rule over a country by force, but he came as the king of love to rule over our hearts. The crowds in Jerusalem that first Palm Sunday, they misunderstood what kind of king Jesus was and what he had come to do for them. And that is why only a few days later, they hung him to a cross. They crucified him. Jesus said and did things that didn't meet people's expectations way back then. And I wonder if he says and does things that don't meet our expectations today. Do we understand what kind of king Jesus is and just what he has done for us? You see, Jesus didn't come simply for the Jewish people way back then, but he came for us. He came into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday for us, for all of us. 
And when he died on the cross, Jesus made it possible for all of us to be set free from the chains of sin and to know peace between us and God the Father. What a wonderful king is our King Jesus. Thank you, kings. Thank you for volunteering. Thank you for volunteering too. You can go sit down now. You can take off your your robes and put on your ordinary clothes. Are you still hearing Mike at the back? You are? Okay. Just double checking. We're going to respond to that uh, in two ways. In a minute we're going to sing, but before that we're going to pray together, and it's a responsive prayer, and so the words will come up on the screen, and the words in red I will say, and the words in white I'll ask you to say with me. Hmm? Let's stand. He wants us to stand, so let's stand. (laughs) The people laid down their cloaks on the road in front of Jesus. So now let's lay down our lives before him this morning. Lord, we want to see people through your eyes and see situations as you see them. Lord, we give you our eyes. Lord, we want to hear your voice speaking to us and hear the needs of people around us. Lord, we give you our ears. Lord, we want to speak your words, words that are truthful and kind and which build others up. Lord, we give you our mouths. Lord, we want to use our hands and our feet to serve you, going to the places you call us to and doing the things you want us to do. Lord, we give you our hands and our feet. Lord, we want to love you with our whole hearts and love our neighbours as ourselves. Lord, we give you our hearts. Lord, we want to obey you. So we offer you all that we are and all that we have. Not our will, Lord, but your will be done in our lives. Lord, we give you our lives. Amen. And we'll stay standing as we sing together our next song, which is Before the Throne of God Above.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you came as king to bring into this world the kingdom of God, a kingdom of justice and rightness, of love and of peace, a kingdom without war and fighting, a kingdom where no one wields power over others, a kingdom of selflessness and compassion. And yet we look at our world today and we see so much suffering, fighting and killing, hunger and fear, pain and anxiety, separation and isolation, greed and oppression. We cry out to you for our world, Lord. We cry out to you for all of those suffering so much in Ukraine, in Burma, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in South Sudan, and in so many other places. Our hearts break when we watch the news, and we know that your heart breaks too. Lord, we ask you to bring healing, to bring hope, to bring peace. And as we ask for these things, we pray that you will show us how we can be your agents of healing, hope, and peace. Help us to be like Jesus, loving and serving others with gentleness, humility, and grace. In the silence, we bring before you all that weighs heavy on our hearts. Help us to hand these concerns, these pains, these people and situations over to you. Come through the power of your Holy Spirit and bring transformation to lives and situations across the world as we lift them before you now. King Jesus, may your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray in your name. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to stand and sing again our final hymn, At the Name of Jesus.
blessing. As we honor King Jesus today, may our obedient lives and praising hearts bring him glory. In the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and remain with us all evermore. Amen.